No, I keep saying that, but I think they're really good speakers coming up. Very relevant to the whole issue of MERS having a future. And I think we'll hear how technology has its place to play, uh, modern MERS, and there is a future, the way forward. So please stay listening, stay in your seats. Now, I'd just like as well to thank our event partner, Smart Solutions, and sponsors CK International, MacTech Services, and SACO. Of course, you can use the right-hand section of your screen, the Q&A section, to uh, uh, send me questions and comments for our speakers. So, I'd now like to welcome to this session uh, Joseph Doherty from Regen and Michaela Druckmann from Grey Parrot. First of all, we're going to hear from Joseph, uh, who's going to do a case study on modern MRF upgrades at Regen. Joseph, if you'd like to join me on the stage, and I'll just introduce you uh, as we go along. Joseph's key role is to lead, manage and hold to account and what he says is an amazing senior management team with a lot of energy in a residual and recycling business. He's also responsible for strategic research and development with respect to new waste streams and alternative energies with strengths in business development and environmental regulation. Joseph's also a fellow of the CIWF. And so Joseph, over to you to speak to us on modern MRF upgrades. Thank you. If you want to share your screen with us, Joseph, or uh, thank you. We will do. You're just bringing them together here at the moment, so yeah, absolutely. Take take your time. It'll it'll, it'll appear. We've got some information in the background of you there, waste you know, with some regen posters, so that's handy. Oh, so, uh, yeah. just share screen and then on PowerPoint side. I'm huh? sure it. There we are. Thank you. We have you there. Perfect. Okay, well, I'll say goodbye and we'll speak to you again in about 15 minutes. Cheers. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for taking the time here. Um, just to get started, if I can get the slides to move. So, I was going to start today with who we are, a um, recycling company based in the north of Ireland. A bit of a timeline to give you a bit of a understanding of the industry and then we'll have some photographs and some sketches of the business uh, currently now over the last 15 years and then a wee bit of a discussion around what I think the next 15 years is going to look like. Um, so look, just starting off, uh, probably a bit of history for me, but back in 2004 we built the facility, we bought a baler, we put in uh, our picking line uh, which is now our pre-pick to the current plant. Um, at that time there's very few bins at households. Recycling was only starting off. Um, our local council area had only a few hundred bins out. So recycling was very much in its infancy. So uh, 15 years fifteen years on, this is the plant we currently, we currently have now. And if you look and you see on the screen, the green part is the part that we started with in 2005. And then we went on then to invest in a film plant because some of our customers especially customers in the Republic of Ireland, collected plastic film. So we were able to pick that. So that part in light blue, it was the part that um, we spent on then for to accommodate that. Then came the glass treatment, which you can see on the outside of the building, there was another treatment facility then added on just for to clean up a glass to be able to set, supply people like with Cresco. And um, then when the operation uh, soared and the green fence came in in China, we invested in a, a mix paper sorting plant with optics and so that was the gradual progression and constantly every few years we're investing and changing and if you can see there this is just some of the uh, changes we've made and you can see it in the picture how from a morph to the green part growing over 15 years into something that's maybe twice the size three times the size of what originally started off so it gives you an idea of how things have changed now if you look at this slide I've tried to sort of give a bit of uh, it's not it hasn't exact numbers but when we started off, the rules come in 1996, recycling started happening. Um, you can see the laws was just introduced. You've got then, uh, we started 2004, 2005, recycling increased. All bins would have been out in around 2009, 10 in our local area, which meant you we were maximizing the collection at every household. At that point, we also added glass, which I would have said would add added a 15 to 20% uh, material to the, to the mix. And we've had an incremental increase with councils pushing uh, people to recycle more. Um, so that's come up until to date. Probably some of the things that have affected that uh, on the outward bound, if you look below, would have been um, the 
China Operation Green Fence and then China Operation Sword, which would have ended the export of uh, paper to China. Um, then 2020, looking forward, and this is what I want to look at for the rest of the presentation is where the effects are looking forward of the plastics tax, EPR, consistency of collections. And I haven't put a date on DRS, but I'm hoping it's further out because it will have an effect. And eventually meeting a 65% recycling target, which we will have to adopt the MRF. So as much as we've changed in the last 15 years, we may have to change as much again in the next 15. And looking forward to uh, see what that will actually look like. So look, the first thing, uh, looking a wee bit back the way, is the reduction in using palms. You're seeing an 8% year-on-year reduction, uh, which um, I believe was discussed by Simon Allen earlier. He was he had read 7 to 10%. So, you know, there's different figures out there, but the trend is downward. If you look at in 2011-12, our mixed paper would have been 45% up to 55%. Uh, during the pandemic, the mixed paper dropped to 28% of the mix. Now, that would also be because all the materials increased, but it gives you the the amount of newspaper that's dropping out of the system and not coming in. So COVID was the biggest change. COVID, I believe, has made a change in the amount of paper that it won't return from. Now, I know a, a number of the newspaper outlets local to us stopped printing for, uh, I think, six weeks. That had a knock-on effect, but that'll get hard to fully recover from that. And so another comment I got from our operations manager was he said that a lot more small cardboard, which I would believe be deliveries, small deliveries to households from the, be the Amazon effect, I believe the Simon, Simon brought up. But then also, what's the plant design effects? Well, we're seeing less newspaper on the picking lines for the paper lines. You're seeing where you would have seen a lot of newspaper. You're seeing a lot less, a lot more card. Um, we at one point would have produced a news and palms grade and we would remove the card. But at a certain point, a number of years ago, we decided that it was economical, so we swapped, swapped to a, a mixed paper grade. Um, we're also finding the flips happening where the rounds lines come and have your, probably because the portion of the newspapers reduced, it's increased the, 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 what I would call the rounds of the 3D. So the, vol the volume balance is changing. And as you look, really, this is a very simple uh, drawing, but a MRF really, it's at the heart is the 3D, to 2D separation. And so you're seeing, I think you're seeing the uh, 3D is taking over and the 2D is, is dropping out. Probably some of the things we're seeing is we're having to put more pickers on the rounds lanes and um, we can't make the using palms. And so that's just some of the things. Now DRS, I see the DRS with the biggest hit's gonna be, I believe that DRS will hit the PET. They're not hitting the HDPE. So PET could be anything from 30 to 40% of a mixed bottle grade that we produce. So we will see that possibly drop out. The uh, effect on that overall, not only the PET, you've also got the aluminium steel cans. There'll be less of that. But so you're seeing 25% less volume, I believe, going to be coming in. And so that's where you're going to see MRFs getting it harder to replace that tonnage to cover overheads. So it's going to be a tougher time going forward if the DRS has the full effect. And uh, I believe Stuart earlier mentioned that uh, 50 to 80% effect. So that would be, if it takes out that amount, that could be that could be a lot of money and a lot of volume going into MRFs and MRFs will have to readjust to that um, going forward. So you're going to see probably the volume change, bottle sorting plants will reduce the PET, there'll be less the bottle sorting plants won't need to sort PT as much because it won't be as large a grade in the mixed bottle anymore. There'll be less steel cans and less aluminium and also then the glass that we would take in will drop a lot as well. Um, so just some of the comments there, I thought of Scotland has gone, um, the all-in DRS, I suppose I'd be hoping if DRS comes in it won't be all-in because that'll then have a bigger effect as well, so I'd have to decide it. But overall, a DRS is going to hit, I would say, 25% drop and at least a 15 to 20 pound a ton value drop on the basket, which is a lot whenever material values aren't that high as it is. Um, so then the EPR, the changes, I wouldn't I wouldn't be as confident on the changes in EPR, but the packaging coming in this will change. I think what they'll get is less types of plastic, and then <coughs> them less types will, uh, there'll be less composites, um, modulated fees, will remove the composites, it will hopefully reduce that, that you're getting a more 
easily recyclable stream. So that should hopefully make it easier. But at the same time, the DRS will cherry pick out some of the good items. So look, the redesign of uh, the packaging, the uh, packaging hopefully coming in will become more economically sort because instead of having seven different types, you may be down to three very economical types at the moment, PET and HD, PE are the two big grades that everybody concentrates on. Um, again, look, the material, the material basket value should combat so the HD that's left on others, that uh, percentage that isn't HD and PET will hopefully be create some value that will increase the basket again. So the design effects in that case is I think we're going to see a PP sorting as well as a, a HD and a PET. And so I think pots, tubs and trays as a mix will reduce them to be a more standardised grade in that case. Now consistency of collections, the material uh, changes coming in, uh, it'll give more clarity what's going in the bin, which I think will hopefully reduce the contamination coming in and so hopefully reduce the need for pickers on the plant because contamination is one of the things that we do have to deal with on the end. The plastics tax, again, plastics will have to have that recycled content. Brands is going to switch possibly in some cases to non-plastic packaging types. Uh, plastics oceans would be pushing that as well, but I think that the plastics as a grade will hold, hold strong. Um, but I think where Murphs will have to go is in a more short and more investment and aiming to get to that uh, food grade standard which is it's actually strange but it's very hard for to get to that food grade standard and so it's a that tax will hit most people starting out the only thing is then there's a lot of investment to happen in certain plants in the uk and that will be coming over the next five years as you can see the big changes coming from we're probably seeing the biggest changes that we've seen since 1996 is coming. So, um, yeah, COVID-19, probably some of the things, that material changes in the breakdown, we see them a uh, large increase in what I would call the 3D, um, your bottles, your cans, steel aluminium, and your glass. We had we went from an average 15% mixing glass to 25%, and it held strong for a number of months. It's now dropped back. Uh, we also have, um, because with that larger amount of rounds, that treatment capacity would have pushed more on the legs of the rounds lanes, which morphs are generally designed for a heavier paper mix. Uh, when we were running, we had to put up perspex divides between staff to make sure they were able to be under the two meters, but also uh, divisions to keep them safe. And there was a lot of other work had to be done around the business, right from somebody walked in through the gate till they left to keep them safe. So we've had to put more people on the rounds lanes um, we had to employ more people to make sure we covered off the risk of sickness if it come. Hopefully that uh, it didn't hit so far, but it could still come and think the second wave could cause some problems. And then we had extra volume overall, which was a, well, probably for an industry, it was, uh, it was a bit of a positive whenever maybe other industries were having to stop altogether. Um, and probably one of the things that we got out of COVID, uh, we would have been Simon mentioned earlier about the egg cartons. We were supplying, we supply a local manufacturer of uh, molded fiber egg cartons, and they doubled their buying and actually went more. They actually went into two and a half times at one point in the peak because they couldn't get a uh, commercial collective material they needed to make some of their best white uh, molded fiber. So, which was, which is a bit of the good thing in that we could support local companies whenever they needed it. And also, see them happen across Europe where there was a bigger demand. So, Probably one of the big things in it all is there was a lot of confusion for us in dealing with the crisis and we had set a number of levels for which we had to react in the business depending on whether it was sickness or maybe even could have went uh, into being told that we had to close the plant but recycling was seen as an essential service and it was great to be appreciated in that way how essential we were in the whole thing but probably the confusion coming up to that was what caused the problem. Now Brexit is also something that's coming down the track and um, we have to we have to look at well what what's going to change. Um, the big thing is the people. We're going to have to employ more people, or the likes of them. We'll have to use optics more, and we'll have to be able to look at the likes of robotics, which I'll talk a bit about later in the in the presentation. Um, and then also, I just want to look at some of the AI. Now at the moment, we have. Been, we've invested in uh, a baler, actually CK a baler the, the, um, we bought lately. Um, this is just a system that we're using to be able to monitor the production, what's been produced on the plant. 
and you can see things like number of bales. You may say, well, what's the advantage of it? We can see the number of bales being produced in any uh, space of time. We can also set targets and then notify that the targets aren't met. But we can also do even uh, things like the number of cycles, number of uh, presses it took to produce a bale, the length of time it took to produce, we see there are 4.5 minutes, number, amount of straps used. All that information helps to squeeze the last 10, 20% out of the efficiency, which is some of the things that's coming. And I think Michaela will maybe talk more about that after. So um, you can see just even there, the bales being produced and the times on the graph. It's, it's brilliant information to have. And it's a great way of monitoring and a great way of squeezing that last bit out of. And I think it's, it's one of the things that's leading us as an industry uh, into a mature base and a mature foundation that we are maybe matching toe to toe with some of the manufacturer, other manufacturing companies. We're not just a, a waste business. Um, the optic sorting, we've invested a number of optic sorts, everybody knows that, that. Um, optics and MRFs, 3,000 picks a minute, so they're a great piece of equipment, but there are some of the things that they can cause a problem with is if uh, you do have a certain amount of process loss, which you have to then try and remove and take back, and that's where we've been looking at robots, and um, probably when you look at the robots, we've done some analysis on it, a person at the moment picks about 40 to 45 picks a minute, a robot can pick 55, but in reality, it gets 30 to 35 uh, positive picks because some of them would be failures. A big mix is that with Brexit, it's getting harder to get people to do the to do the manual work. Um, people would usually pick at max 55. Uh, robots, one thing to remember is they don't get tired. They work 24 hours. It take, but the problem is it takes double the space in a MRF, so to retrofit that, is a big cost and in some cases you have to move building which we're looking at at the moment and i see robots their job will be to replace people cleaning up after optic sorts that's where their position will be and it's probably somewhere where we're going with robots in the next uh, year or so so um robots really i mentioned earlier and we work on the process loss so just there's some photographs of some of the robots and um, gives you the they are, there's going to be more development on this and we're at the early stages and um, I think it's something that we will be will be looking at very closely in the next few months. Now also then, this is another bit of technology that we're using in the business. More so, we started SRF and RDF as well and the risk of fires higher in those, but we have it throughout the business. And if you can look at uh, the top left with the red square is, that's the machine loading the recycling plant. And so we are able to block out the heat of the engine and the thermal cameras are able to monitor the area all the time so that if we get an alarm straight up if there's anything that's causing any problems or if there's any temperature spikes. And you can see on the right, this is a conveyor with materials moving from a shredder. So the different colors, you can see the, the uh, purple color is the higher temperature and it, it gets lighter as the uh, temperature goes to fire and it'll set an alarm and you can set also sitting in the yard has gone on fire, hasn't been touched for maybe a day or two where something has smoldered in the trailer. And so we also monitor the trailers and you can see where we can draw a square in the area that the risk is in and the temperature and it can set an alarm as well. So you can see just some of the technologies that's coming to improve and we can, we're can we using technology more and more. Another just an example of a thermal camera of the material feeding from a SRF shredder. And you can see the, the temperatures, the red there is the higher temperatures. Um, and like how small of a differences in temperatures that this can record all from a distance. So look, to summarize up, I think there's going to be significant changes in the next 15 years. I think that the volume that's available uh, will reduce if DRS is, is fully successful and that the balance of 3D is going to be the bigger volume and 2D is going to decrease. And I also think that uh, optics robots have a part to play, but I think the robots have a bit more uh, development for to be efficient and AI I can see as we see we're adding it into the business and I see a lot more happening which I believe Mikhail will maybe talk more about so um, thanks for listening and I'll in, hope to hear your questions after. Lovely thank you very much Joseph that's fascinating um, you know the fact you're thinking of robotics in the next year um, and material changes I feel so sorry for all those local newspapers. Being a journalist myself, it's a it's a sad world in terms of uh, the internet. And it'd be nice to see more of a balance. And your 
obviously getting more brown. So um, I'm sure that will have prompted some questions. So do in the audience, please um, tap out those uh, questions for Joseph or Michaela in that Q&A section on the, on the right of your screen and we'll come to them. So Joseph, if you'd like to step down from this virtual stage, and then come back in about a uh, quarter now. Thanks. I'd like now to invite uh, Michaela. Would you like to come on to the stage, please? Michaela Druckmann, uh, I'll just give you an introduction, Michaela, as, as you join us. Thanks. Uh, Michaela is the co-founder and CEO of Grey Parrot. It's a UK tech company using AI waste recognition technology to increase transparency and automation in waste management. Uh, with extensive experience in applied innovation, Michaela's passionate about implementing new technologies to solve key business challenges in the waste sector. And she's aiming to unlock the financial value of waste and also uh, to help keep the planet clean. So Michaela, very pleased to welcome you. Hope Thank you can you. hear me, okay, great. That's good, well if you'd like to share your presentation and then um, I'll, I'll return to your side in about 15, 18 minutes or so. So thank you very much, Michaela. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, so my name is Michaela Druckmann. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Grey Parrot. Um, and in the next 15 minutes and in the Q&A after, I'm here to talk a little bit about AI robotics and specifically waste recognition uh, software. So at uh, Grey Parrot, as a quick introduction, we're a technology company. We're experts in AI and computer vision. Um, and we are specifically specialized in waste recognition um, to help digitize uh, the monitoring and auditing of waste uh, and our really our goal is to empower waste managers, MRF managers, producers, regulators, all the stakeholders involved uh, in the value chain with better data analytics to be able to inform policy and also help us uh, transition to a more circular economy. So before we dive into the topic I just wanted to speak quickly about AI and some of the changes and hopefully demystify a little bit uh, what AI is uh, for those of you who are maybe less familiar with the technology. So in the past five years, there's been a huge acceleration in the progress of AI, thanks to computing power becoming cheaper and cheaper, um, data access and open source frameworks that allows to build uh, more valuable models and also more and more pr proven use cases in industry, which means more uh, investment is going into the technology. And specifically, um, on computer vision, so AI related to image processing and the ways computers understand images, there's been a huge acceleration as well. Um, and you might have heard of the of the word machine learning or deep learning, and, and that kind of says it all. We're moving to a place where machines are learning by themselves instead of us telling them exactly which parameter we are looking at. So in the context um, of images, for example, we are moving away from telling uh, objects by size or by shape or by very, very specific requirements, but instead um, helping algorithms to learn by themselves how to identify these images. And specifically, techniques like deep learning are essentially making big changes in industry. So face recognition, cell driving cars are all powered by this. So if we take a PT bottle here that can take any shape that will be divided into thousands and hundreds of thousands of pixels, and then models will identify themselves what makes them and what features makes them a PET bottle. And essentially, that means that in the past few years, that thanks to these techniques of deep learning, image recognition has really um, uh, expanded immensely and is now being able to beat human performance in certain specific tasks. Um, and so that's allowing big changes in different areas of industries. So how does this affect uh, waste management and MRFs? And so AI and robotics can address multiple challenges, uh, contamination, expensive manual sampling and sorting, and a general lack of, of data insights on waste composition. Um, and ultimately what we believe is that if something isn't measured, it really can't be optimized. And these technologies are helping to do that. So here is um, some examples of how uh, these technologies can help um, uh, improvements along the value chain. So, you know, starting all the way from, you know, collection, looking at smart bins that can identify contamination, reverse vending machines that can uh, monitor the waste that is coming through, smart trucks that can 
uh, see what materials are coming in even before they go into the MRFs. Obviously, integration with robotics that we will talk about a little bit more, but also um, uh, in MRF specifically, being able to adapt machines, have adaptive machines based on the input um, of the waste, quality guarantee per bale, and automated monitoring. So some uh, more detail on, on how the solution works. So in our case, our solution is an automated waste monitoring system, which provides waste analytics. And it's composed of three elements, a monitoring unit, AI vision uh, that recognizes those material, and that data is then outputted into reports or live dashboards that can allow to have dynamic machines, pricing by quality, and certified waste flows. And of course, these AI vision systems are then also integrated with different types of hardware like robotics, trucks, bins, etc. So this is an example here of, of uh, this monitoring unit. Um, so the advantage here, so this is a, a box that has a, a, kind of a camera processing unit, lighting, all the elements that is required to have a consistent um, flow of images, and it can be retrofitted in, in different MRFs and different um, settings and essentially goes on top of moving conveyor belts and can adapt to any speed that is there to capture uh, the flow of the waste. We then use a complex uh, image recognition in AI to identify uh, and analyze this material. So just showing different uh, examples here. So this is, for example, in the residue where there is um, a, a large number of different uh, categories uh, that we are trying to recognize or specifically here trying to identify paper or uh, subtle differences between, for example, plastic stream um, and even brand recognition. So there's different levels at which we can do the recognition, material, object, brand, and also extrapolate the weight uh, from these materials, which is essentially the most um, uh, valuable way of looking at the composition. And uh, so this is an example then of how that information is outputted. So uh, here we see a detailed report on um, a residue line, for example. So this can come in the form of reports, but also in a live uh, in a live dashboard and can be integrated in other systems uh, that might be used by the MRFs. And so what we've seen um, in the past in the past year is that the, the areas where uh, this is most used in the MRFs is at different areas. So the first one is on the input line. So to be able to understand what is the material coming in and how that is changing and especially with the changes recently when the impact of COVID that has been more and more relevant uh, so that the, you know, the recipes and the adaptation to this new stream can happen more uh, smoothly for the rest of the operation, but also to give back information to local authorities, for example, to help them understand where the contamination is coming from and potentially inform more targeted education for recycling. The other area is very much on the end of material lines, especially in plastics like PET, HDP, for example, to detect the purity level and being able to guarantee and measure um, continuously the purity level, especially as markets are demanding more and more um, uh, high, high quality. Um, and finally, another area uh, of impact is um, the residue line. So they're really to understand what valuable recyclers are being lost. Uh, and that's really the, the, the beating heart of the MRF of understanding how efficient that is. And so the combination of having data on all these different points is basically allowing to optimize um, the, the systems more effectively. So what, we're, what is happening is that we are essentially digitizing uh, manual, manual sampling and waste composition and really moving from small amounts of samples that usually have a time lag um, to automated and real time um, understanding of what the waste streams look like. Um, as we mentioned, these vision systems also are embedded in uh, robotic systems, especially at the quality control level to be able to uh, do the final picking. So we've already seen some of these images in the different presentations. Um, and so, you know, the most common robot is the Delta robot, which is this kind of triangular uh, robot with a, um, a suction cup. There's also uh, other robots being tested that are maybe more nimble and smaller to be able to retrofit in facilities. Uh, but ultimately, and a bit controversial since this talk is about robotics as well, but 
you know, we can't just see the robotic arms as being the solution because most likely what will happen is that these vision systems will also integrate in other types of mechanical separation like air jets, for example, or other optical sorters that are already on the market to upgrade those. So when we think about robotics, it's not just a robotic arms, but it will definitely upgrade other types of mechanical separation. And so I just wanted to move to a few project examples. Some are in the UK, some are abroad, just to give you a, a flavor of, the, of, of some of the different projects. So this is in South Korea with a partner called ACI Chemical that operates 60% of MRFs there, where we are specifically uh, measuring the purity level in PET streams. So this is something that the optical sorters can't do. Um, and so it's separating, for example, PET trays from uh, PET bottles. And all our algorithms are basically able to make uh, that differentiation and, and ultimately report on the purity uh, level that is outputted. Similar uh, in a perf in Italy, uh, where we are looking at uh, clear PET streams to inform actually the pricing um, of the um, of the of the of the material. And what we believe is that we're going to move more and more towards a dynamic pricing based on quality um, versus right now small samples that define the pricing. And in here, we'll then be also installing our system on uh, on the different um, other colored PT lines as well, <clears throat> as you can see here uh, also with the video. Um, this is another example uh, in the UK uh, with BPR groups, a commercial um, uh, uh, MRF. And here we are measuring specifically the residue line and looking at uh, cardboard and paper and what valuable materials are basically being lost in the residue line. And as you can see here, there was a high peak of material and we could identify that in real time. And so what we see is that this data is allowing to have both um, short-term reaction, for example, here there's an anomaly and therefore um, certain um, uh, uh, systems can be changed in the moment to be able to adapt that but also with a longer term view of understanding what are the trends um, of, of efficiency that are happening. So, you know, does the efficiency vary from local authority to local authority or the difference between uh, day shifts and night shifts, which is not only informing, you know, upgrades or, or more technology, but sometimes just training people in a different way, for example. Um, Next example here um, is another one in the UK where we're monitoring all the packaging lines and actually doing brand recognition for EPR purposes. And I know that's what discussed as well uh, extensively today. And that's probably going to be a theme that is more and more recurrent of being able to identify the packaging as well at uh, packaging and brand level uh, to be able to inform policy and actually enable some of these policies as well. Um, so as a as a conclusion um, from all these uh, all these different examples um, and from everything we have heard today, um, I really believe AI technology will enable us to transition to a smart MRF. Um, so the same way we're moving to smart cities, uh, this will be the same here. And three big themes. The first one is that uh, these uh, will allow data driven decision making. So having real-time information on composition and other aspects of the MRF, which will allow to have in-the-moment optimization, so machines uh, changing recipes or changing parameters automatically, but also being able to make investment decisions based uh, on the data. And this is especially relevant for uh, MRFs that have to upgrade and not necessarily starting from zero. The second one is uh, automated. So automation was a big team today, but again, not necessarily um, translating that into only robots, but this can be different types of machines and also um, automating the sampling and being able to have uh, some of these tasks very difficult to happen uh, in real time. And finally, uh, transparent. So many, uh, as we've talked about, more and more policy will require to have better information and better data. And having this continuous flow of analytics will also allow uh, not only the waste managers, but also uh, local authorities, regulators, brands to have better insights uh, on, on the waste composition along 
uh, the flow of waste. Um, so hopefully that helped understand a little bit more about AI and robotics and how that can um, change the MRF of the future. And I look forward to the following q and Thank you very much. Lovely. Thank you very much, Michaela. I think a round of applause from our virtual audience there. That's good. Very interesting. Well, Joe, would you like to, Joseph, would you like to come back onto the stage as well, please? Join us for, uh, we've got about time, 10 minute time for some quick questions and, and comments. So very much robotics, um, MRFs, um, mixed paper lines, plastics, lots of topics there. Uh, uh, let me start with a question, please, if I may. Um, Trevor Smart says uh, to Joe, Good presentation. Uh, can I ask you scale and size of MERS changing in the coming years? And what do you think will be the optimum size of MERS taking into account new technologies and economics? So sort of the size and scale of MERS. What's your thoughts, Joseph? And well, probably looking, looking back the way I would have said five, 10 years ago, 100,000 ton was the, but now when investments get heavier, you're starting into bigger investments, you have to push the tonnage up to do the overhead cover. So you're now getting into 150 to 200,000, maybe even above that is going to be required because this AI technology needs to be paid for and it is needed. So you have to you have to invest heavily, uh, but you also need then the tonnage coming in to back that up. So yeah, about 150 I, to 200. Can I push you both a bit there, perhaps on the economics, because Obviously, Joseph, you, you mentioned that you could lose PET to a DRS scheme if that came in, comes in. So that must make investors and financiers a bit nervous, perhaps, about the future. And then you've got, obviously, Michaelia's, Michaela Systems. Uh, I'm, I'm sure they're not cheap. I'm not saying they're expensive, Michaela, but I'm sure robotics is, is expensive. And Joe's already said that as well that some robots can be a bit slower. Uh, so, I mean, do the economics, uh, is it going to be difficult to finance MERS in the future, do you think? Um, perhaps Joe, Joseph, go first and then come to you, Michaela, if I may. Yeah. Well, I'd be sort of thinking, were you losing the PET, you're losing, of a, let's say, a mixed bottle three, it's maybe 15% of a MERS overall mix. You're losing possibly 30, 35% of that. They're not lose it all, it has to be 100% effective. Mm -hmm. So you're losing uh, three, four percent, let's say, drop in overall tonnage. But also why I would hope is if the makeup of the mixed bottles, 35% PET, 35 maybe HD, and then others pop stubs trays, I'm hoping that there's going to be an economical value increase in that, which I would hope would offset. If one thing I've found in this industry, it's amazing how it's like guacamole, you hit one mole down and another one comes up somewhere else. And I think it's the opposite as in, I think PET will go but I think the industry with consistency of collection, uh, modulated fees, you see it make fight back in some way and give the industry back something. And so mm -hmm. we hope, hope it gets yeah. more level. You're right. It's, it's, you know, different materials seem to become more important. And you're probably right, too, that you need bigger size MERFs. What, what do you think, Michaela, in, in light of you know, robotics and costs? Absolutely. So robotics definitely have quite a significant uh, cost. Uh, on our side at Grey Parrot, we, we don't provide uh, robotics per se, but the vision systems. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that we believe that first, by being able to have that data information from, and, and that is not expensive, these are not large investments and they can be retrofitted anywhere, that allows them to justify certain investments that are possible or not. So even with current, without changing anything to the facility, just by optimizing systems, potentially training people better and having that data to constantly optimize the, um, the, the MRF, there can be some significant improvements already without having to revert to these very large investments. And I think that's why it's very important to separate what is the information and the data analytics from these actual mechanical robotic uh, systems that involve uh, much bigger uh, investments. Actually, very interesting, yes, because Joseph, you touched on that in your presentation. You had that Baylor information. So it seems what Michaela's saying information is one thing, um, sort of automatic information, and robotics are another. Would, would you see that as a fair point? Oh, yes, yes. Actually, probably even thinking about it, the data, the data will help drive, make a decision to invest in a robot. So it's, 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 you need the data and yeah, it's something that I would totally agree with. The data is the cheaper part to invest in first and that cheaper part might lead to 
helping make big decisions on some big investments. But I think that you need um, you need the tonnage coming in possibly going up, and that will be a struggle. You are right. I'm hoping that MRFs that aren't spending and aren't investing will close, and MRFs that are will get bigger. Yes, I can see that smaller MRFs and uh, coming under more pressure, as you say, as the industry changes. I mean, very uh, perhaps a quick answer if we may, um, it's a bit along the lines of what we've been talking about, but Victoria Karajit, she asks um, to both Joseph and Michaela, do you think we could see MRFs becoming fully automated within the coming decade? It seems there is a massive decrease in human intervention. Mm. So, I mean, is, is full automation on the cards, Joseph, perhaps by the end of 2029, 2030, or, or before? If, if I was to look at where, I think there's always going to be an element. I think that you've yeah. been reduced by percentages, but I think that the human intervention for the quality that's required, you have a balance to meet in that AI, and that's probably where the refinement will come in through time. There's a certain risk of process loss, so monitoring the residual to be able to tell where your loss is. So, for example, on a newspaper line, where you have an optic firing off a piece of cardboard or a contaminant, it can take a piece of newspaper with it. If you want a top quality, problem is then you have a risk of that process loss. You have another either robot or picker or uh, optic to fire back the paper. So, at a certain point, you can keep that going, but at a certain point, you have to accept when enough's enough, and a person can be a good finish to that. And the technologies, if look, I would be skeptical of thinking there'll be nobody. Will it be down to 20% of where it is now, 30%? Maybe yes, but I think to get below that would be a hard ask. Maybe Michaela may disagree. What do you think, Michaela? Just briefly on yeah. that point. Uh, I mean, I think there is definitely going to be a large increase in automation in, in, in the, definitely in the next 10 years. Does that mean full replacement of human intervention? I don't think necessarily. Um, there, I think there will be a reduction in human intervention because even the sampling, if it happened automatically, some of the separation, and not because there's robots, just because the existing machines will upgrade themselves as well. Um, but technology is also helping to enhance people that are working in the MRFs. So for example, if you're able to have continuous data flows on, uh, like Joseph was mentioning on uh, the performance of the, of, the, of the MRF, then on the composition, then on, on other elements, all, these, all this information helps to make better decision-making, especially for a MRF manager. So I don't think we're going to a non-human intervention, but there's definitely going to be an increase in different parts of automation in the system. And a 10-year timeline is probably correct to be able to get there. Thanks, thanks, Michaela. I've got a few more questions, if I may, to you. So, um, Stephen Waite um, asks, uh, it's, it's to do with separating uh, household and non-household material. He says, hypothetically, what's the best way of automatically recording the type brand composition of separately collected household and non-household material before it is mixed together? So is, is, there, a, is there a way to automatically record the type and brand composition? Uh, Michaela, is that something that that could be done? Yeah, so I think that's that's kind of where we're heading. Um, the challenge right now is to be able to have enough hardware and sensors that can measure this at all points. And that's why the MRF is, is an excellent starting point because that's where you gather large amounts of waste and you can start yes. measuring data from there. So already if we're measuring data there, that will inform a, a lot um, uh, what happens in the rest of the process. But where we're going is that we then want to start having that data earlier. So how can we start looking at information in the trucks, potentially in the bins? But for that, the hardware will have to become significantly cheaper and accessible uh, to be able to do that. So I don't think that's quite today, but definitely in the next 10, 15 years, you can imagine the same way again, that we're looking at smart cities that have sensors everywhere, We'll be probably looking at there's been some um, be everywhere there's some suggestions of watermarking products sort of an invisible watermark um, that might make life easier i think for ai um identifiers do you think Michaela? Or? yeah so i think watermarks have definitely um, um a role to play 
But something to be noted there is that for watermarks to happen, this is a significant investment from the producer side. And that means that everybody needs to buy into it, which, which probably won't be the case. You might have some of the big players buying into it. So I think we, we still have to be open to multiple solutions that don't involve a significant change to production lines. I mean, Joe's um, another question, if I could put to you, um, really regarding um, to, you know technology perhaps closing the gap on quality. Um, are, do, you, do you expect monitoring units and to be able to distinguish the difference between contaminated target material and non-contaminated target material? Perhaps, Joe's, if you could come in here on, you know, would would, would technology help you in the um, to improve quality? Um, Michaela, I mean, can, can it dis distinguish between contaminated material and non-contaminated target material? The question came from Francesco Forbes. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yes, with enough data, you can basically recognize any of these differences. Um, and so, kind of the rule of thumb is anything that you can identify as a person, you can build into an algorithm. So, for example, a pizza box versus a greasy pizza box, that's definitely a problem uh, a distinguished, uh, you know, a differentiation that can happen, or a, you know, empty bottle versus full bottle, all these types of things. Thanks, Joe. I mean, uh, Joseph. I mean, presumably, you, you you think that technology will help close the gap on quality. It's uh, something that you could use or do use. Yeah, yeah. I think that the likes of the uh, what Michael is talking about, um, it needs to be probably some retrofitting in more. So sometimes you made of belts running that have a depth of material because they're not actually in sorting, but so you might have to, a bit like an optic sort, you have to prep the material ready for to meet the data collector. Because if it's too if it's too deep, it'll not work. So I'm guessing there's a bit of a uh, conveyor investment to get that to work. Maybe the conveyor needs to speed it up or might need reconfigured so that the data can be collected right. But I think, yeah, I would like that data. Hopefully it's not too much of a cost, but I would like that data to then help drive decisions in the business and make it easier to make decisions. Thanks. Can I, um, really, we almost need to draw the event to a close. Could I just ask one other question, uh, which we have here from, from the audience? Um, probably for you, Michaela, certainly come in, Joe. Um, does AI have any recognition blind spots, such as black plastics? So black plastics can be recognized. Uh, ex again, the same way as as humans, we can see that it's a pl black plastic tray. Uh, that is that that recognition is possible with the AI systems, and that's where the big difference is with the traditional machine vision optical sorters is that you look at the whole context of the material versus just one point of the material to define its its composition. Thanks, thanks, Michaela. Well, um, jo Joseph, anything you'd like to say, um, and Michaela too perhaps sum up um, from conference today and particularly on your side of technology and MERF development. Any, any final points you'd like to make, Joseph? You, you, you painted a changing picture and more investment ahead, a bit of uncertainty. Um, probably like to say, look, I learned a lot today. I, uh, I, I think that's that's a great thing. It's been a great speakers. Um, I think that one of the things, and it was uh, Tim Gent, I would like to maybe I really want to focus on him. He was very honest and unbiased in his, but I think that uh, government looks too much back the way and policy yeah. looks too much back the way. And I think that we need to find a way to educate government on the, abil the ability of technologies to close the gap on quality. And one thing Tim says is he's getting more glass from the areas, and that's true. And Michael mingled uh, the glass collection areas are far bigger tonnage. But we need the technology then to fight back against the quality issues, which I believe is happening now. And I've been investing and will invest more in the future. But we need government to realise that that's the sweet spot, not just going back the way and restricting people and causing more inconvenience to people at the household. We need to be looking forward and make a technology do the work because people in their busy lives, we have to make recycling easy and simple and convenient, not hard and have to think about because with so much information in our lives now, it's less. We need to give people a lot more uh, information. So, look, really enjoy today. Thanks, Joseph. That's good. Great. Michaela, any, any sort of closing thoughts from, from yourself? 
So. Yeah, I mean, echoing what Joseph said, it was a very interesting day. And what was interesting is that it's it's a lot of the same themes that came came back and back in different uh, contexts and different themes around you know changing changing ways, needing more flexibility, um, having more policy influence, etc. Um, and and technology can enable and help with some of these things, but you know, the industry and technology providers and follow and regulators need to work very closely together for, for actually to make it optimal and, and, and make sense. Um, so I hope this kind of conference also enables uh, more conversations in that sense, but it definitely was very insightful uh, for us. Great. Well, thank you both of you very much, Michaela and Joseph. Uh, I'll just give a few closing thoughts. Um, I, I would like to say we're ending on a positive note and I really like the idea about looking forward rather than looking back with MRFs. We've certainly moved away from the day when MRFs were almost questioning their future, perhaps around 2013, 2014, 2015. Those years were a bit uncertain, but maybe their, their time has come now. And certainly from what we've heard today, operators and reprocessors ready to work with them and, and the solutions are there. So hopefully all the audience can go away with some positivity and you've enjoyed the event. Do um, you know, keep in touch with us. We'll be covering all this on electricycle.com. The Today's presentations will be available through a link later on to you. So if you wanted to double check something again, and I'm sure all our speakers are equally easily contactable at their various organizations. Um, so just on a formal note, I'd like to thank our event partner, Smart Solutions, and sponsors CK International, MacTech Services, and Subco. Um, just to conclude by saying we hope you enjoyed the virtual experience. I mean, the forecast that we saw perhaps from Stuart today was that the COVID and recession is going to last a couple of years with the impact. But I really do hope that we're back together again to actually meet um, face to face in 2021, the end of 2021. So certainly set that as a target, if not before. <laughs> so, well, thank you very much, Joseph and Michaela. And uh, I'll now bring this all to a close. So if you could close your cameras and microphones. I think there's a, a short video to follow us. Thank you.